for joining us today for this episode of Author Talk. My name is Aaron, and today I'll be talking to Harvey Martin. Now, he is a former uh, pro baseball player who founded and owned the Mind Strong Project, uh, where he uh, trained some of the top athletes and business executives in the world. Uh, I'll let him get into a little more and explain a little more about uh, what he does, um, what he's up to now, and why uh, right now specifically he's the envy of most baseball fans. <laughs> Uh, right now. Um, but he is here today to uh, talk to us specifically about his book, uh, Breathe, Focus, Excel, uh, Exercises, Techniques, and Strategies for Optimal Athletic Performance. So again, thank you for joining me and carving out some time. I know this is a very busy time of, uh, of the year for you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm in Arizona right now. I just got down here uh, a couple weeks ago, actually, but we have, we're running a few winter camps. I'm here with the San Francisco Giants. Um, we're running a couple winter camps here for some prospects and then we got spring training coming up in February which is uh coming up quick so right. yeah so I'm down in Arizona for the next couple months and then I'll be in uh California for the summer but uh, as in regards to the book uh okay. yeah I've been in the breathing space for almost 10 years now actually thinking about it right now it might even be a little bit over 10 years I got into breathing uh when I played played professionally as you kind of mentioned uh, in that that startup I played in 2013 to 15 I was with the Milwaukee Brewers um and before that when I was at Minnesota State I got into sports psychology a little bit and uh, those are great parallels you know you sort of have psychology and breathing and um, I used a lot of it in meditation and mindfulness and uh and tried to improve my athletic game um, when I got done, I found a lot of uh, breathing, not in sports, but for my personal life. And I found a lot of health benefits uh, and mainly, which I think a lot of what is in that book is the control of the physiology and the nervous system and what you can do uh, with your breath. And when I got a hold of that, I really took off and the rest was history. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I know that and you uh, you obviously mentioned it in the book um you, you have a unique story about your playing career that uh you kind of used to it sounds like you used to transition more into what you're doing right now um can you take us through that because i, I think it's awesome to do what you do on a daily basis and um and help people but uh for you to have that i guess uh, unfortunate experience and kind of live through it uh, probably offers a completely different perspective for how you're able to approach this yeah so i mean i think i, I what i had is categorized in baseball as the yips um yeah. and in a simple way like for I think a lot of people i always i always assume that everyone knows what the yips are so i don't want to necessarily assume that in answering this question but uh really like the best way i can explain it is i was able to throw a ball into the zone and throw strikes and look like a normal professional baseball player and pitcher and then uh, uh a, kind of a slow start but i got to the point where i couldn't throw a baseball anywhere near a play um, and I started to freeze. So they're kind of like the way I explain them is the yips from my experience. This was a while ago, but from my experience of what it feels like is uh, you essentially have like a panic attack in all the time in, in games and in performance and you do whatever you can. And at the time I didn't know really what was happening. I, you don't experience the yips until you experience the yips. <laughs> And uh, when I was going through them, it was like, I didn't really understand. I didn't really know what was going on. Um, and then when I got out of sports, I sort of had some lingering anxiety. I got released from anxiety. That was the big part of it, right? And so I could no longer perform my craft. Um, a lot of that was psychologically daunting, as you can imagine. And I felt a lot of that was in my mind, which, which it is. Uh, but what I've learned over the last 10 years or so is that most modern humans have altered physiology in some sort of way. For me specifically, I got crooked teeth, you know, and it's probably hard to see through here, but I have crooked teeth. My jaw is pushed back. Um, I have really poor uh, tongue posture. I talk a lot about that in the book. Um, and I was a mouth breather, chronic, and still am, chronic mouth breather. I was uh, breathing through my mouth at sleep for my whole life. I was a snorer. I had a dry mouth. I had all these certain things that disrupt physiology um and for the significant amount of time i didn't really look into that and then when i figured out when i started studying a lot of these things uh out of sports um i started to alter my physiology back and sort of take control and i think when you start to control your physiology the best way i felt like when i had anxiety is uh you felt like you were in a cage like your nervous system was always uh controlled and you're kind of like shook like you can't you can't move freely you don't feel free 
Um, once you change, in my case, changing the breathing, a lot of that took place at sleep. A lot of that took place nasal breathing. A lot of that took place figuring out how to move my diaphragm. Um, once I was able to do that on a daily basis, reps and reps and reps, I started to notice my physiology, my nervous system sort of down regulate chronically. And I, I got myself out of those states, which was obviously really positive. Okay. Oh, one thing that, um, I want to ask to kind of transition from there is that, and you, you started to answer a little bit of it, but um, I think a lot of people recognize like why what you do is important. And, um, you know, I think it's definitely becoming more common, um, but I'm not sure everyone knows exactly how or why they would benefit from uh, practicing their breathing techniques. Yeah, I think like the, the simple way to answer that, and that could be a long, long conversation yeah. <laughs> all of us could have, uh, I think the simple way of talking about that is that in our autonomic nervous system, your breathing is your only controllable. So when I'm talking about your heart rate, your blood, uh, the way you're moving, your breath is the only way that you can actually control the autonomic nervous system. So you can regulate your heart rate. You can start to move blood in certain ways. You can create space consciously and you can do all these sort of uh, these things and you're uncontrollable. You can do them in a controllable scene. And that's where I would say like breath is the ultimate superpower. And it's not, it's scientifically, yeah, great. It's shows a lot of science, but it's also philosophically, it's been around for thousands of years. Like these are the main principles of many teachings across many cultures and traditions for thousands of years. So I think if you just want to find confidence in the traditional sense of that being the foundational practice of control and sustainability that that plays absolutely but then you find modern day science that sort of shows us how we regulate the nervous system how we do certain things and i think i i, I mentioned this in the book about a cadence or coherent breathing which is very pendulum style it's very neutral in and out it can be four or five seconds in four or five seconds out you're just basically creating this neutral breath style um and when we do that i always imagine if you would imagine your head down to your spine that's your nervous system it's like a violin string okay. when you breathe you sing to the string so when you train yourself to breathe slow that string stays neutral and that's signaling to the whole body that i'm safe i'm calm i'm in a regulated state i'm able to control my thoughts my body my movements uh when you breathe fast you start to move that string really quickly. Um, and that's where you burn energy with that's unneeded, you know, and I think where this becomes uh, moving away from a philosophy or a science and thinking about this as a modern human. Now, um, everything in our environment is alarming. Like I, I perfect example, I thought I was going to be in a really beautiful sunrise uh, palm place that I've got lawnmowers going off, off trucks alarms all this stuff and i thought i was in a really calm quiet spot this morning and i think now in the way in which we live in modern society with foods we eat with sounds we have with population and all this density on us uh you're really keen to have your nervous system get away from you because you're breathing all the time unconsciously and so when i think you can slow down spend times during the day and you can consciously control that breath and that nervous system you start to take back control of physiology and ultimately uh, your life. That makes so much sense. And um, as we're relating this, this to sports and uh, your your, your uh, situation that you kind of went through, um, I guess relate that even more because that makes so much more sense. In the, in the book, you talk about using different breathing techniques and how you can really use that to control your emotions because yeah. anyone who's competed or performed at any level knows that um, you know, you can get a little bit anxious, you know, your heart rate is going to increase, but it sounds like you're using these breathing techniques specifically to just calm yourself down so you can be more present in that moment. Yeah, I think that in sports specifically, everything is always going to upregulate yeah. you. So it, it, I, I mean, there's times, there's definitely times where you would use breath to upregulate, mm -hmm. uh, look, specifically in professional sports, like the travel is so insane. And this isn't yeah. just baseball is really intense because you play every day. Um, but this is all sports, like you travel and play, you change time zones, you go to elevation changes, heat, cold, mm -hmm. night, day, you're always changing environmentally. So anytime there's a disturbance, uh, in the environment, you, you have. <laughs> so maybe sometimes you're fatigued and you need to upregulate. And we talk about that in the book as well. Yeah, yeah. 
maybe that's some faster breathing. Maybe that's some sort of breath holds. Maybe that's something to uh, get your nervous system activated in that sort of sense. But I think specifically surrounding emotions and sports specifically is that sport is spontaneous, which makes it fun for viewers and fans to watch. And, and right. it also makes it really fun to play. But the spontaneity, that's what drives emotion. And so uh, we love to see that, but as a, as, a perform- as a fan, you love to see that. We might bash on someone for reacting in real time, but we also, as a fan, you like want that because that's the entertainment value. Mm-hmm. As a performer, you don't want that because that takes away from what you're talented at. So I think that you would naturally, consciously already uh, predetermine that you're going to emotionally react to stimulus that's happening in a game through spontaneous acts all the time. And I think that you would think back to what I was saying about the autonomic nervous system. In real time, what's the only thing you have control over to kind of generate space back in your thinking? That's your breathing. Right. And, and when you think about it, if you're, if you're getting fast, if you're getting reactive, typically underneath the conscious level, that just means the breathing activated. So you're okay. starting to breathe faster because of performance. My heart rate's going up because of performance. You're obviously moving and sprinting and running mm-hmm. or thinking and doing other things. So everything's elevated. And it, breathing is that slight edge that you can use in real time for two seconds. Like you can have in between plays, in between shifts. You can have in between pitches. Um, you kind of have that like one or two breaths that you can have to slightly lower the heart rate, slightly give you a little bit more space to be less reactive. Or you have longer stands you have a half time or you have a two three minute shift yeah. off the mix, or you have um a full inning where you're sitting in the dugout and now you can actually grab three to four minutes five minutes worth of breathing that you can actually truly down regulate and bring yourself back but i would say in sports specifically everything is mostly most of the time is always about down regulating because you're naturally always going to be up so in that book the down regulated practices i would i would say handled 80 i'm making this up but subjectively 80 to 90 percent of a game is down regulated how would you approach um i i know something like this is probably very individual so if you're consulting with someone uh, you could do that uh, you know kind of one-on-one and go to their specific situation but um and i know it's probably much more nuanced than this but like how how would you approach say you're uh, talking to a team like what are some of the basic factors that you would talk to them about to kind of control some of those aspects? Yeah, I would say uh, the first thing is, and let's see if I can kind of shift this a little bit. Okay. The first thing is, can you see me yeah. up here? First thing I would say is mechanics. And the mechanics are because if the diaphragm works, you're, you're pretty good, right? <laughs> but I would say like the first thing is if you think about your diaphragm, it sits like an umbrella and when you inhale, Inhale, it flattens like a pan, right? And it kind of goes around the whole body. Why that's important is because of gravity, all your oxygen, all your down regulatory feelings and receptors, it all lives at the bottom of the lungs. So for people who are listening, if you just take a deep breath through your nose, you know, and you feel your initial movement and people over time can hear this back and just take time thinking about it. When you're breathing through your nose, knows initially the first movement of that is diaphragm movement it lowers and you should feel your first initial movement of the body below the nipples right around the bottom of the ribs that's how nature set us up to breathe so when we nasal breathe we pull the diaphragm down we open up the lungs and we circulate the bottom of the lungs where all that parasympathetic that rest regenerative oxygen is so nasal breathing is an aerobic calming down regulatory state which is why we should live in a nasal breathing state all the time Um, but if you if you just want to say okay how do i take that with me in performance well then you would just know when i have these moments to to relax to get less reactive to get myself open all i need to do is get a nasal inhale the exhale you can if you're in performance most of the time it's going to be your mouth you know if you're outside of performance you're outside of training it'd be all nose but all you would need to know is that my nose signals to myself to calm and to bring everything down and that's activating the diaphragm that's opening up the lungs circulating oxygen that's really positive so back to this movement if you take a breath through your mouth i kind of showed it there but you (laughs) you would feel you should feel uh upper chest just naturally that should be the first initial movement of how you're breathing okay so once again 
nature set that up because this is a signaling that we're in fight or flight. So if I'm in training or I'm performing or I'm competing, nothing wrong with this. I'm in, I'm using that for a very minimal amount of my day or my time. And it's very directed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to live like this is chronically over breathing. You're using yeah. less oxygen. You live in a fight or flight state, which going circle back to the beginning of this conversation, if you're doing that like I was on a regular basis for years on years and years, that is going to correlate to very altered physiology. And in my case, that turned into anxiety and, and performance. So it really disrupted me. But I would say if I'm talking to anybody, the first thing I ever say is one, learn how the diaphragm moves. Yeah. So it sits like this. When you inhale, it flattens. So you should never feel this north to south breathing. You should feel this east to west breathing. And that's okay. why that thing pushes you out. It pushes you horizontal, not north and vertically. Mm -hmm. right? uh, then understanding how these govern that naturally. So if I'm you know, just new to breathing, I'm not perfected with my mechanics. Well, let's learn to slowly breathe through the nose first because that will naturally create that movement. That'll naturally train yourself to be able to control and calm the physiology of the nervous system. And then having an understanding of what this mouth does. You know, that pulls upper oxygen, not much up here in the top part of the lungs. Right. It pulls the auxiliary muscles. You're not using diaphragmatic, strong, good breathing muscles. You're shouldering, you're doing all these things. So think about life, you know, think about where you sit, think about how you stretch, think about how you move, and think about how you're breathing. I think if I think if those are, are just understood. I think you can take a lot from that um, and start to create your own practices or your own understandings. And that's one more thing. And then we can move on to the next thought. But it's like, that's why a cold tub or sprinting or training or all these things are really good uh, activators to learn how to breathe. Because you figure out, you go into things that are stressful, you naturally want to get here, right? And if you're non-stressful, you naturally breathe mechanically sound. All right. I think that's so interesting. You did a great job of explaining that. I'm thinking back to when I was in grade school, like maybe fourth or fifth grade, and like maybe my parents and my teachers always told me to breathe through my nose and not through my mouth. But they never explained why. <laughs> it's like, it, was, it wasn't clear, but uh, no, that makes so much sense uh, the way that you just explained it there. Um, now, I know you mentioned, um, you know, kind of cold tub um, as, as one thing to help out. And you do mention this in the book um, for everyone that has a book or hopefully you're going to pick up a copy of the book. This is toward the end um, where you do get into kind of cold exposure, heat exposure and kind of that heat and cold contrast. Um, one thing that I think is interesting, you mentioned at the beginning of the book uh, from your own experience and at the end is that uh, how we can put ourselves in certain situations to embrace that stress and kind of learn from it. So what I guess tell the listeners, uh, viewers, like what did you mean by that and how can we how can that really be beneficial for us? Yeah, I think like Look, like I, I went for a hike last night and I went on a hike uh, over the weekend and I'll tie this into cold tub. So I'm not going to go super deep into the hiking. But the point is, is that uh, I went on a hike this past weekend that was really nerve wracking. Um, I got up to the top of the mountain and I sort of had this moment where I like froze. Right. I had this freeze moment and I had to break that and get through that. And at the end of it, at the end of this hike, I was like liberated. I was free, you know, and I, I felt uh, positive. I felt like I had grown and, and, and grew up in <laughs> my mind. And, all that. and th my point is, is that it was deliberate. It was intentional. And so when you place yourself in that, the brain, the capacity of your brain expands. You, you sort mm -hmm. of, uh, you expose yourself to some anxiety. You learn how to work through it. And that's, again, where breathing comes in because this okay. is your controllable and you can become aware of it. And now if my awareness expands, then I can do more things. That's why anxiety is not, we don't want <laughs> because it stops us from, it stops us from doing things and uh so that's my example of what happened to me recently in the last couple of days with the cold tub the cold tub is just a and same with the sauna i think the cold tub is a little bit more faster it's real time okay. you get it instantaneously uh but you're deliberately exposing yourself to a stress that's the same thing you do in, in a weight room, same thing you do in a book or in a conversation you don't want to have, all these things that happen all the time in life. You're, but in cold, it's training. So you're training your stress response. You're training your awareness. You're training your nervous system to control stress in real time. So the other part of it that becomes really, I think, beautiful is that uh, when it's controllable, like a training setting, like a cold tub, 
you have nothing to do but focus on breathing. Uh -huh. So I jump into this nervous system activator. The cold triggers my nervous system and it freaks me out and I freeze, right? right? And that's why people, are, they get into a cold shower or they get into their cold tub for the first time, they start. <sighs> And that's a natural response, mouth breathing, sympathetic, anxiety, fight or flight, all these sort of things. So that's an amazing time to deliberately downshift your breathing, control your breathing, get calm into a cold tub. And you watch people who they'll mouth breathe, then they'll control the pace of the breath. They'll go into the nose eventually, and then they'll get all the nose. And then they do five or six, seven cold tubs. They can go into the same degree that they were originally in. They can breathe only through their nose. And you see them control their nervous system physically. And it becomes a great deliberate practice to understand stress, to understand breathing. It's very forced. I don't like to use the word force because it sounds aggressive, but it's a forced meditation. It sort of forces a meditation out of you. Um, and it makes you obviously very present and aware. But I think that the correlations of that uh, the return on investment of a cold tub and learning your stress response and learning how to breathe in stress, it correlates to everything. It correlates to stress, it correlates to uh, traffic, and then obviously it correlates to performance. It helps you understand feelings of physiology instead of trying to comprehend your mind all the time under pressure. So interesting, so interesting. Um, so this has been a fascinating conversation. I know that you have your, your camp today. You're a very busy person, but uh, so I wanna be respectful of your time. Uh, but for our listeners and viewers, uh, if you haven't got your copy yet, um, get it ordered now, go pick it up. You can find it on our website, us.humankinetics.com. I know you can get it on Amazon, uh, probably some other places as well. Um, you'll find everything that we talked about today, so much more, there are different, uh, I, I guess, he you go into like kind of the science behind breathing, uh, specific breathing exercises, much more than what you uh, talked about today. So um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I will actually give you the last word here um, uh, to uh, kind of wrap it up and maybe let everyone know like where they can follow you and keep up with all the great things that you're doing. Yeah, yeah perfect. Uh, I mean, my accounts on social are just Harvey J. Martin. I keep it pretty simple. So Harvey J. <laughs> Martin and uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. Um, those are pretty much the main ones. I have a podcast that I had for a few years and, and you'll see some more things coming out in 2024. I kind of took the last two years off on that uh, just from other projects I was doing mostly that book. <laughs> um, a little time consuming there. <laughs> yeah, it's a little time consuming to write a book. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think that something that's really important to me is just being able to communicate and have platforms like this to share the importance of breathing. It's, um, I think being a modern human is very stressful environmentally, just the way in which we, our society is sort of set up around us. And I think that that correlates into performance, obviously. Really, I would just say to all athletes and anybody really out there is to really comprehend how consistent breathing is and how much it impacts everything. Uh, a lot of times we want breathing to be useful to us only in the moment that we want it to be useful for us, which makes sense. I'm fine with that. I understand that myself included. But I think if you understand how that moment that you need your breathing is basically a byproduct of th hundreds of thousands of moments leading up to that moment. And that's where uh, studying everything becomes really important. So whether that's slow breathing in the morning to set your nervous system up for the day whether that's getting into the cold to learn how your nervous system to strengthen your nervous system whether that's doing that in a sauna whether that's getting good sleep whether it's learning how to breathe through your nose if that requires taping your mouth if that requires getting your diaphragm to work whatever that requirement is i would say the most important thing is to to become somewhat aware and understanding of how you breathe on a daily basis and it should, and I'll keep it simple, we'll wrap it here, but uh, it should always, unless you're eating, talking, or working out strenuously, or competing very aggressively, or talking like this, it, um, it should be through your nose. Okay. It should be very quiet, um, through the nose. And I had a mentor tell me years ago, which I've always stood through, he said, if you can hear or see your breath, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and I always thought that was a cool thing. So you should always just keep that in mind. If I can hear my breath, I'm breathing too much, I'm breathing too loud. I should always have no sound in my breath. It should be through the nose, very calm, very rhythmic, and I should never really see it. I shouldn't be a big body breather. Everything should be still and calm and, and quiet.